you're gonna come out and say that you paid us more. All right, so today we have four lawyers who are going to review the U.S. women's soccer team's documentary, LFG. My name is Nate the Lawyer. If you are new here, we talk about the law and the facts. If you are about that life, don't forget to like this video, share this video, and subscribe to the channel. So you guys know who I am. Let me introduce you to my team. Hey, I'm Andrew Esquire of The Legal Mindset. <laughs> Check out my channel, Legal Mindset, on YouTube. And I'm here today to tell you that the gender pay gap is an absolute myth, is an absolute crock on both the facts and the law. And we're going to break that down today looking at LFG. Hey, guys. I'm Alita from Legal Bites. I have a channel on YouTube, and I'm also on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and Locals. On this channel, we explain the law one bite at a time. I do believe that there are cases of sexual discrimination in the workplace, seeing as I have actually litigated cases like that. However, you'll find that this case is not one of them. Oh, hi there. Didn't see it. I'm Viva Fry, a Montreal litigator turned YouTuber, and this is Winnie the Westie, and it's his one-year birthday today. How do you feel about yourself? All eyes on me, friends on me, girls on me. Uh, I'm here just to say that uh, CNN is trash news. The mainstream media promotes fake narratives and then doubles down when they get caught. And we're going to expose that and further elucidate that which they have been caught misrepresenting today on this video. So now you know the team. So the way we're going to break this down is in three parts. First, we're going to hear the actual complaint. What is the argument from the women's national team against U.S. soccer? Now, these arguments are going to be presented by lead counsel Jeffrey Kessler from the women's national team. And he's going to present to you their arguments for unequal pay. Second, the documentary is then going to address the counter arguments made by U.S. soccer against the women's complaint. And again, it'll be Jeffrey Kessler who's going to present their legal arguments. Lastly, we're going to see the aftermath of the judge's ruling and see how the women's national team and their attorneys handled losing in federal court their equal pay claims. So without further ado, here is lead attorney for the women's national team, Jeffrey Kessler, explaining what the lawsuit is about. The U.S. soccer team are suing the United States Soccer Federation for equal pay. Full stop here, we need to be clear about what the initial cause of action is, aka it is, you know, equal pay for equal works. So we need to be very, very clear about that uh, from the jump. So it's a, it's a, it's crucial here that we first understand that the work has to be equal in order for the pay to be equal. Well, in order to have that argument, that pay should be equal at least. And, and so the questions you should be asking right off the bat before you even get into it is what would equal work for equal pay look like or equal pay for equal work? How many games are they going to play in a season? How long is the season? And then from there, you're going to have to extrapolate the facts. But those are at the very least the base questions that will need to be asked by their employer who pays more money to the men's team than the women's team, even though the women's team are the world champions and the men are not. Stop. All right, I'm stopping Stop it there. there. I know, yeah, I know it. I know it. I know it. I just want to go ahead. Okay. And, and it's very interesting because, um, it, it, again, it, it would have been a lose-lose, but I think it's more of a lose this way because they were negotiating the contract. They had the option, someone will correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think I'm wrong, to accept mm -hmm. the men's contract which Correct. they're complaining that they didn't get, knowing that they were world champions, that they could Correct. very well become world champions again, knowing the benefits that would accrue to them if they accepted the men's deal, having been former and potentially future world champions. They said no. They went with something, like Andrew points out, that guaranteed pay, to play, guaranteed pay regardless of whether or not the members of the team played. So they negotiated it freely. And the fact that they were world champions before, knew they could be again, and still went with the contract they went with, Barring adhesion, fraud, or any other, you know, any other uh, trick that might have vitiated their, their consent, uh, it's going to be tough to find something to complain about. But I, I right. do want to go back to the, to, to the first, to one point I think is going to be important, is that what he's saying is not, is, is actually now that now we know it's not true. The women didn't get paid less than the men, either overall or on a per game basis, right? The court found right. as a matter of fact that the men were the ones who were paid less. But I was just going to say, as as a general matter, that we're, when we're going into a contract dispute, for whether it's this case or any contract case, you know, you have two parties going into a contract that are trying to minimize a 
a certain amount of risk and trying to maximize a certain amount of potential for themselves. And so whatever the, the, the two sides are comfortable with in terms of risk or whatever they're trying to get in terms of potential is going to be a factor in that. And neither side will know what it's, what it's going to look like on the other side of that contract, right? At the end of the, that contract term. So to then go to the end of that contract term and then look back to the beginning and say, well, now that I know exactly how this ends, I want those terms to be different. You can't do that in contract law. Yeah, that <laughs> sour grapes, unfortunately. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, so right now, just off the bat, factually, he's incorrect, right? The women, because that 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 this is yes. one of their key issues. They, the key, the foundation on which their lawsuit stands is the fact that they were paid less, both overall and and via and their rate of pay was less. And the court found those two fundamental pieces of their lawsuit were untrue. Let's let me let's go back to the lawyer. They have been discriminated against by their employer who pays more money to the men's team than the women's team, even though the women's team are the world champions and the men are not. So merely for showing up and playing a game, the men get more per game than the women. Now, I do want to say this is false, too. Merely showing up and playing a game. That's not true. The women get guaranteed money. So the women don't have to show up. They don't have to play a game. Think right. about and the COVID year, I think, is the most the, the most elaborate piece of this because during COVID, there were no games. And the women's team got paid about $3.5 million in salary and full benefits, while the men got absolutely nothing. They got zero because that, that was the nature of their contract. So to say this, is it's misleading at best. For each game they win, the men get a higher bonus than the women would get for winning that game. For qualifying for the World Cup, uh -huh. the men make more money than the women make. For advancing in the World Cup and for winning the World Cup, the men make more money than the women would. Men's World Cup generates about four, six billion dollars in income for FIFA. The female World Cup or the women's World Cup generates about they, they say between two to 300 million. They, they haven't really settled on the figure, but I'll give it 300 million to be fair. So that difference between 6 billion and 300 million is the reason why if you win the Men's World Cup, the prize pool is 400 million. And if you win the Women's World Cup, the prize pool is 30 million. So the women are essentially saying they want to be paid out of a $400 million prize pool for only winning a tournament that has a $30 million prize pool. I think one thing, one thing that's important to note here is that the argument that this attorney is making is he's looking at the numbers in a particular vacuum, right? He's looking at these numbers only as bonuses, not in the greater context of all of the compensation that is being paid to these players. <laughs> so at every single point in time, there is a difference. That's, That's true. That's just a There's starting a difference. place in money. <laughs> then we have to add to that all the other discrimination that's taken place. The fact that the men will go to five-star hotels. Now, I'm going to fast forward through this part, but I do want to say this. This would, this did go to trial, and they settled. I just, I would be curious to know about this. I mean, what's, what do they call a five-star hotel? Five-star doesn't mean quality, by the way, for people out there. It typically means amenities, so you can have a pretty crappy five-star hotel if it has pool, whatever, bar and stuff. Uh, but I'm curious. I mean, I, I we know the lawyer was honest enough to admit they don't actually stay at Motel 6, nor would I have expected that. But I, I would have been curious to know what were the actual discrepancies or differences between accommodations. Did it have anything to do with cities in which they traveled? I mean, I, I would like to flesh that out a little bit. But if you're playing in a lot of these international venues. If you traveled internationally, yes. you know, if you're playing in the national major fields, those are in the center of the city. You have to stay within center city hotels and you're not going to stay at the seedy, you know, sketchy alley hotel. You're going to have to stay somewhere that's <laughs> reputable, which will likely be a five star hotel. Right. And yes. on right. top of that, when they say they played in better fields, once again, these larger, yes. more well-maintained fields are going to be better. A lot of times women's teams are smaller for smaller capacity purposes they will play in smaller fields which are on the fringe they're on the outside right and they might look a lot more like a motel six and and another thing that's that's interesting to note here is that a lot of these fields are fields that as has been mentioned that, that you just mentioned that uh these fields are, are are owned by these other teams right so these are not owned by u.s soccer federation so how how can it be that they are the ones that are responsible for for providing you know 
absolute equality on uh, on these fields on this issue. Um, now, of course, as Nate mentioned, they settled. So obviously, there's there's some amount of of uh, responsibility or control, I guess, that they can take in negotiating, perhaps, with these other teams. But it's not absolute. It's not as simple as as paying a certain compensation to an employee. So women, women, thirty million dollars. Men's World Cup, four hundred million dollars. This case is not about FIFA. It's not about the fact that FIFA discriminates massively against women. It does. Okay, we want to pause that's that. Not- <laughs> 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 that's okay, now let's hang on here, right? Because this massive bonus uh, discrepancy for the payouts for winning the World Cup is 100% dependent upon FIFA, which is an entirely different organization. So, you know, the law is going to hold certain entities responsible if they have a certain amount of control in this situation. But U.S. soccer only has so much control over FIFA. They have a certain payout that FIFA gives based on FIFA's resources, based on FIFA's income. So, uh, yeah, this 100% has a lot to do with FIFA. So him trying to poo-poo FIFA is just a non-starter, I think. He's starting on the premises, the incorrect premises that it's gender discrimination. To to put out those two figures and then to dupe your crowd into not understanding the underlying figures, it's as good as lying. It, it might be even worse than lying because you're leading people <laughs> to think you're telling the truth. It's like saying the women played in a poker tournament and the winner only won a million dollars, but the men had their own poker tournament and the winner won $10 million without mentioning that there were 10 times as many the entrance in the men's tournament so the prize pool was bigger to split up i mean this is genuine bona fide dishonesty to say it's discrimination because they only got 30 million whereas the men got 400 million without mentioning that the draw of the men's is 20 times more than the draw of the women's this case fifa doesn't pay any money to these players they pay money to federations like the u.s soccer federation and it determines how to divide up its money between the men and the women. They refuse to pay the women equally because they thought they could get away with it. You cannot <laughs> treat women like this in the workplace and get away with it. They, they pause it. They thought they could get Hold away on. with it. Hold on, but before you get, just let me get this last statement because this okay. is it. It's like, what's the one? I don't think we thing. were going to win. I never would have taken this case. <laughs> All right. Oh. <laughs> sorry, sorry. I can't, I can't <laughs> <laughs> All right. Viva. <laughs> so the fact that you get four lawyers <laughs> laughing at this, any every lawyer says, I, I, I wouldn't take the case if I didn't think I would win. Every lawyer has to give a reasonable assessment of success and failure. And even in the best of circumstances, there is no slam dunk of a case. But right. for him to say, every case has a loser, right? <laughs> he just says, it, they refuse to pay the women equally. What does equally mean here? Does equally mean prorated based on revenue generated? Or does equal just mean equal equity where the equity brought in is itself not equal? So if they paid the women half of what FIFA as an international organization brought in, it would be unequal because the women don't bring in that same amount as to the men. So the equality that he's talking about is actually outright inequality. Yeah, that's it's equity. What they want is equity. What they're pushing for is equity. What they're trying to redefine the law in the United States as is supporting equity. But simply, when you look at stuff, when you look at the actual law, it's not there to support this equity argument. The basis is not there. You have to have the underlying facts to support this. And when you look at the underlying facts, as the judge found, they're just not there. I uh, I, I just think that, um, I mean, he said that I, I would not have taken this case if mm-hmm. I didn't think that we would win. Um and knowing what we know, I, I mean, yeah, it's laughable because it just, it's, it's, how could he have possibly thought that? More than likely he thought, hey, this is a great case that's going to take a long time and I can bill a lot of hours because Biller's got a bill, man. <laughs> Biller's got a bill. Okay, another way. I, I think he viewed this as a social media fight that would settle and they would get yes. a, a fair settlement out of, just from the negative publicity. And that's when that fair. didn't work. And when that didn't work, what do you do? Go to CNN and have them produce a documentary that's going to be lob- you know, outrageously lopsided and missing information for context. I mean, yeah, that's that's plan two. Okay, so now you've heard their legal reasoning and complaint against U.S. soccer. Now you're going to hear U.S. soccer's response to those complaints and how they feel about it. And we're going to do a little bit more commentary on it. But 
if you haven't already and you're at this point in the video and you haven't subscribed, come on, what are you doing? You're killing me. So USSF makes a number of counter arguments against our case. <laughs> I don't think even one of them has the slightest bit of merit. All right, I'm stopping because I know people want to say something about that. So yes, he says the none of the latest bit of merit. That is no, not they, even a colorable argument. So, so are you <laughs> telling me, counsel, that you are going to motion for sanctions on every single one of them, every single defense? You're going to be like, you know what? It's not colorable. Let's go but, for sanctions. It's bad faith. Every and, single argument. That's but, what you're by the way, do, this, counsel. Uh, a good lesson for lawyers to not say things like this publicly is that now you basically, you tempt the judge and a judge came to the conclusion that not only what he said was wrong, but that it was double wrong. And so this guy basically in advance calls any judge who disagrees with him out of their mind. It's not, it's, it's not the best practice. Uh, well, remember they, they don't have any good legal, the, the, these arguments won, my friend, they count arguments won, let, but let, they don't have any good. Let's see how he steelmans those arguments. Let, oh yeah, oh yeah. Steel man's. No, you, you'll love it, you'll love it. It's gonna be, this is gonna get good. If you guys <laughs> haven't seen this, it's gonna get good. Here we go. So one of the arguments is that if you look over the last five years, there are some women on the team who actually got more compensation than some of the men did. <laughs> how could that be discrimination? Well, it's very simple. The women played more games than the men. They were more successful than the men. And they made the World Cup, and the men didn't make the World Cup. So, Okay. Here we go. So I'm the sorry, first was that thing. Ooh, was that ooh in the video, or was that us? Yes, that ooh was in the video. Oh, my. Nothing tacky about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Are they are they loser shaming now? Are they shaming the men for having not won in a more competitive league with with, with... Okay, yeah. sorry. I'm, imagine yeah. if they had done that if the women had lost. Ooh, you didn't win. Oh god. So with this part, so with this part, just particularly, um, U.S. Soccer's first counter argument is that we paid the women more, um, and we paid them more per game and overall. He's saying that. I don't understand what his beef with that is. Oh, yeah. Do you anybody now, understand? What, what, what he seems to be implying here, for those who may not be able to discern it, is that they were paid more, but they played more games. Now, what he's not mentioning here in terms of the steel man is that my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, they were paid more per game and played more games. Is that wrong? Correct. Correct. The the okay. court found that they were paid more per game and overall. So they so so if they play 10 games. Both teams played 10 games. The women got paid more than the men because their rate of pay was more. Also, one thing that I think really should not be lost in this conversation is the fact that according to the court, they actually negotiated for more games. The yes. women said, we want more guaranteed games than the men. So now, of course, on this side, they're like, well, the women had to pay more games in order to, to make the amount that they did. They asked for more games. What are you talking about? How is this a problem now? But at the time he's making these statements, the court found, as a matter of fact, that the women got paid more, not just because they played more games, but they their rate of pay. So it's like me making $20 an hour and Viva making $40 an hour. Even with discriminatory agreements, yes, it's true. Some of the women made a total compensation in dollars more than some of the men. Does that make it equal? Now, this is, I think, very, I think this is very deceptive because he's not saying, the judge in this case said, the women's team made more than the men's team. They're saying, as you see, the quote here is, some of the women made more than some of the men. Now, this is good lawyering, guys. I got to say, this is oh, good yes. lawyering. This is very good lawyering because- Good it makes missing. It, yeah, it makes it seem like well, some of the women. It could just be Megan Rapino. You know, it could be some of the women, and you know, and night. So, so it's it's very deceptive in that way. I it, the, the it's so it, it unnerving and irritating and frustrating to listen to him again say even with the discriminatory policies. So, so it's like just repeating the conclusion as though the conclusion is a premise to the argument. We're trying to get to whether or not there was discrimination, and he's baked it right into the equation so that even if some of the women get some more, it was despite the discrimination. It's just it's it's like that's... going to your doctor and saying, Hey, I've got cancer, so which treatment are we gonna go with? You know, before you've <laughs> even got the scan. Nice. No. Because equality is about the opportunity. The USSF does argue also that the men generate more revenues for US soccer. 
Well, that sounds good, right? Well, that should be a basis. The problem is, it's not true. Ooh! Since 2015, we have their audited financial statements. All the revenue they assigned to the women's team and the revenue they assigned to the men's team, if you add that all up, the women have made more than the men's team for USSF. Well, he the said for USSF, that's a big caveat. The highest TV ratings in this country for any... Like, what's the issue here? They made more per game. They made more overall. And they're saying, well, and they only made like a million dollars more than the men. It's not like, you know, they made 40.9, 49.9. They made 50.8. So, so it was like, you know, what more do they want at, at a point? They, they, it's not like they, they made 10 times more than the men or $60 million more than the men in income. They just, they just barely made a little bit more. And, and, and now they, they want $60 million more to make a hundred, you know, just because they made a hundred thousand dollars more. I don't well, get so, it. I mean, this is, this is where, I mean, I, I haven't seen the documentary and it wasn't out of laziness. Nate, you told me not to watch it. So it's all yes, fresh yes. and new, but it sounds to me like what he's doing is framing it so that you have the impression or the viewer has the impression that women make more for soccer than men. And so when they demand the 60 million or whatever from FIFA, the FIFA portion, people are going to have that lingering, uh, you know, taste in their mouth that women make more for soccer than men. We'll see if he recognizes that the men's draw in FIFA brings in 400 million compared to the women's 30 million. Sorry, 6 billion versus 300 million in terms of the gross, not the uh, net payout. Yeah, 6 billion, which is crazy. The soccer game has been the championship game in the World Cup of this women's team, not a game of the men's team. And then they say, well, the women agreed to the agreement they have. They agreed <laughs> to their compensation. So why should they complain? They accepted it. The problem with that is they were never presented the men's deal. They agreed to the best agreement presented to them at that time. Had they been paid under the men's agreement at the same rates, these women together would have made far more money. We believe the number is in excess of $60 million more for the last four years. Is, is it not true? Is it not true that the, the, the men's contract was presented to the women? That is it's true. Not, that was that yeah. that was that was that was in the court documents. They presented the men's contract to the women, right? Well, this is the court document set. So they so so the court went over the um the negotiations and, and through the depositions. And during that, the court the court found that US soccer offered them the men's deal. But the men's deal didn't have the same amount and bonus structure, but it had a lot more, it had a lot more. So when the women's team got the deal. They didn't say, well, we don't want this deal because of the money. They said, no, no, we don't want that deal because there's no guaranteed money. And then you saw that within the, within the negotiations. They said, well, we, we want guaranteed money, so we don't want that structure. So when they were presented the men's deal, it's not like they said, we don't want that deal because it's not enough money. They said, we don't want that deal because of structure. We want guaranteed money. So, and that's why the court found that, hey, when they offered you the same structure and the same thing as the men, you guys rejected it. Go well, ahead, that, So that's just, I mean, that's just as a pure matter of fact, and it seems... Uh, if I'm being, uh, you know, weighing my words, the lawyers, what he just said is false then that the women yes. were, they were presented the same structure, whether or not it was the same contract written up on a piece of paper, they were presented the same offer, which they refused as a matter of structure because they wanted guaranteed pay, which did not exist in the men's contract that was presented to them. Correct. And, and mind you, that is the first time in that infographic where we see guaranteed pay pop up. That is the first time that anywhere in this, it's been represented that they have guaranteed pay for regardless of whether they play or not. Right. And also, I, I, I kind of caught the insinuation there that he was hinting, oh, they were kind of unrepresented or they weren't properly represented. Yeah. Which frankly, is not true. No, I mean, but even, you know, even if they hadn't been offered the same contract, I mean, there's that's that's not even a guarantee that that would have been uh, uh, fatal to U.S. soccer. I mean, because at the end of the day, these are both very sophisticated parties that are contracting, that are negotiating for a contract. Okay. There are lawyers that are representing both sides. And if you just didn't negotiate the greatest deal for your client, sorry. Too bad. Courts are not necessarily going to be terribly empathetic to your cause if you had all of the opportunity to negotiate and you actually did engage in in vigorous and substantial negotiation and you didn't have issues like 
undue influence or fraud or or things like that. Yeah. So here, this is what see men's pay to play structure, higher bonuses, right? And they now me to the best degree, but was that guaranteed oh. salary plus benefits. Oh, it's my. a very quick graphic. <laughs> it's very easy to miss. Oh, oh you what they, did, but they, they didn't lie, and they did disclose that CNN produced the the documentary as well. In en passant, they mentioned it. A black screen. It's you know, quick. it's very easy. Yes, yeah, very fast. It's very easy to miss this. This is even, very even the amount of words. Say, Alita is saying everything matters. Graphics matter. So when the men's comes up, look at the amount of words. Look so at how tiny it is. They have. They had five words in the first line, like three words in the second, you know, and versus three right here. So they're making it seem like just graphically it's simple. Had they been paid put a, put a under the for men's second. agreement at this the is, same rate. You have soft bigotry of low expectations. This is soft misogyny of lowered expectations. They accepted the best offer that was presented to them. Like these are damsels in distress that are incapable of doing anything on their own for themselves. And they just gobble up and accept whatever the man presents to them. This is belittling of the women's capability to know, negotiate their own contract just as a matter of principle and undermines what they actually did as a matter of fact and as a matter of law. You have this guy saying, these, they don't know anything. We just they, we just gave it to them and, and, and they accepted it because they don't know any better. It is soft misogyny of lowered expectations. These women together would have made far more money. We believe the number is in excess of $60 million more for the last four years. So this is not a question of apples and oranges. This is a question I mean, it kind of, is. of women doing the same <laughs> yeah, job apples as the and men pomegranates. for the same employer on the same size field under the same rules, except they do it better and get paid less. Not all that's true. There, there, there's so much in there that's lost, right? But that, that, that's how you close. But the thing is, is, let's judge this attorney's performance. That's who I want fighting for me, right? He's got yeah. a whole bunch of crap, and he's he's they they they've massaged it up. So now I'm like, my God, these women are being crazily discriminated well, against, right? He gets he gets points for zealous advocacy. I can't say <laughs> about his legal scholarship, but zealous advocacy, yes, he's got there's, there's that. nothing easier than easier than zealous advocacy when you have no one challenging you, and the people documenting it all agree with you and don't want to even have you say the hard statements publicly. Yeah, it's it's zealous, it's ignorant, naive, and it's mischaracterizing the entire debate, but. He's advocating for the position of his clients. If if this documentary had not been done by CNN, and if this had been done instead, let's say by somebody who was just, you know, just very intellectually curious about this issue and just wanted to get to the bottom of it. And so they wanted to interview both sides and and negotiate or not negotiate, but discuss with both both uh, both legal counsel um, on, on both sides of this issue. This guy would have ended up looking like a buffoon. Next to yeah. the other attorneys. If you had got, if Cernovich had done this documentary, if, uh, you know, as someone who, with with a remote amount of intellectual honesty, they would have asked the questions. I mean, they would have of asked course. some questions instead of just letting this guy. But, th but this is a curated propaganda package for CNN, by CNN, to promote the narrative that CNN has been promoting for the last three years. Serious music. U.S. soccer response to their, their lawsuit in the press. Over the past decade, U.S. soccer has paid our women's national team more than our <laughs> so they so really this is making a mega response to it you're gonna come out and say that you paid us more it's a lot i'm so i'm so sorry megan that the facts hurt your feelings because <laughs> they're, they're just what they are those are the facts I, I mean i don't know what minute we're in in the documentary this contradicts everything we just heard the lawyer say and their way of writing it off is megan rapino saying what no yeah, okay, and then you have the explanation as to why they had to win more. I'm not sure that I believe the argument, but this, as a matter of fact, contradicts everything that that lawyer had just been saying for the last 15 minutes. And on top of that, it does contradict the ruling, because now since we know the ruling, it contradicts that, because the ruling says no. You know, for instance, let's just let's just take even the ruling out of it. COVID year. the co Last year for COVID, the men made nothing, zero. They didn't have to, you know, they played any games. The women made $4 million, in excess of $4 million more than the men. So are they looking for a discrimination lawsuit? Because I think we got some lawyers that might be able to take that up. For that. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll steal, man, the response to that, Nate. We talked about it in the last video. They're going to say, yeah, but the men got paid less or nothing last year. But average that up with what they've been overpaid for the last 20 years. The only reason they can get away with it is because they made so much more than us in the last 5, 10, 15 years that they – 
you know, they can survive a season with no pay because of the structure well, of the contract. So now, Mega Rapino is going to tell us what all of this means. <laughs> Woman's playing. Nate, Nate colored my appreciation of this so already. <laughs> what the judge said was that, first of all, we agreed to the deal. Okay. And it turned out to be not as good. And so you can't just agree to something and then it doesn't turn out the way you like it or the way you want it. And so then you go back on it. Okay. Uh, so, yeah. well, so, well, so, do we agree with that <laughs> one? No, no, no. They agreed to the, the deal. The frame on which you freezed was hilarious again. <laughs> <laughs> they agreed to the deal is one part of that statement and it was not as good as the second part. <laughs> <laughs> the O face. Yeah. yeah. This is a spin. I'm about to spin the hell out of this one. <laughs> Just remember, if you, if you freeze frame Philip DeFranco at any point in time, you can <laughs> never get a frame that does not look something like that. <laughs> uh, she, the, her statement had two parts to it. They agreed to the deal and it was not as good. And I think the second half of that, people might not agree with, but the first half of that, I think everyone agrees with. They agreed to the deal. And it turned out to be not as good. No. Oh. And so. You can't just agree to something and then it doesn't turn out the way you like it or the way you want it. And so then you go back on it. Sure. Obviously, the point that the judge, I feel like, missed was that we never had the opportunity to agree to the same deal. So the men got to, you know, do their negotiating on the top floor and we started in the parking lot. I love how they make the clip to the parking lot, right? In the parking lot, right? Yeah, exactly. Because that's exactly where they made them do it. They're like, you know what? No, no, no. We're we're back. We're back in the shed down here with the generator, some rats. That's where you guys get to negotiate. You really, you guys, and I just, I want like a big American Idol buzzer right there. Like, eh. this is reframing the entire litigation now. the The entire litigation had been hitherto pre uh, premised on the idea that they were discriminated against in the terms of their contract. Now they're saying. We, we we freely negotiated them, but our consent was vitiated because we were we, you know we weren't even given the uh, enough information to make an enlightened decision. That's an entirely different claim, and and unless I'm mistaken, Nate, they didn't make that argument in the claim at any point, and yet that's somehow the conclusion as to you know where it all went wrong. We never even had the chance. With information was withheld from us, we weren't given fair opportunity. So when we agreed to this contract willingly, our consent was vitiated. I don't think they ever made that argument in the pleadings. They actually don't even say that information was was withheld from them, like material information was withheld from them. They just said they never offered us the same exact contract as as the men. And I mean, that, as we've said many times in this video, is definitely not true. <laughs> she's I think she's now being deceptive in the sense of saying, well, we you know, we weren't offered the men's deal, which they were, you know, oh, but we 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 were negotiating in the parking lot. No. You were negotiating on the top floor with the men. And when the men said, we don't care about the guarantees, we're out of here. And you guys said, no, pay me $100,000 worth to play. That doesn't seem like you're negotiating in a parking lot. You're negotiating per, on the top floor. You know, and going to some of those benefits, Nate, per, uh, maternity, dental, insurance, uh, uh, guarantee, child, child care. Off? Child I'll care. read them off. So this is what the women's team get. They get 20, 20 players at a base salary of $100,000 per, per, per player. Then they get 11 players for the National Women's Soccer League. And... If you're a top tier player for 11, 11 top tier players with an annual salary of $67,000. So for instance, like Megan Rapino, she gets a hundred thousand dollar base salary for the national team. Then she gets a $67,000 base salary for the women's net for the national women's soccer league guaranteed. So they get, so during the COVID year, she got the hundred grand plus the 67 grand. Then they get another 11 players with salaries for the national women's soccer league at um, $62,000. Per player, so you got eleven at sixty-seven, eleven at sixty-two, and you got the twenty at a hundred thousand dollars. The eleven at sixty-seven and sixty-two, do they overlap or do they not overlap? Or no, they, they do not overlap. So the, at the sixty-seven is for the top tier players, and sixty-two is for the second the second tier players. Okay. So then the next thing they get, they got um the team got a one-time signing bonus for anybody on the for two hundred and thirty thousand dollars, they got a ticket revenue sharing of a dollar fifty per ticket. So each ticket, they got a dollar fifty per ticket. They also get severance be severance benefits, injury protection, full health benefits, full dental benefits, full vision package, full pregnancy pay, guaranteed rest time, child care assistance, partnership bonuses tied to increased viewership. They get an annual payment for their player likenesses. And there's a good faith effort to play a minimum number of games. And if they win the World Cup, 
the team gets a two hundred fifty or $350,000 post-World Cup tour check. Everything that I just read off is what the women's team got during COVID, too. So don't forget that that hundred those hundred thousand dollars salaries and six, that's all what the women got during COVID. The men team got no none of this, no insurance, no 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 nothing from from U.S. soccer. So that's I think the big issue that now they're they're gonna have to face is because COVID I think COVID hit the women like I always say COVID hit the women's team harder than it hit the world because it really exposed the fact that on the upside it's true the men can make more money but on the downside the men can make zero while they but they're capped at about $4 million in, sal in um, salary and benefits. That That's that's a hell of a deal they got, you know? So. And then also what Judge Klausner said was over the course of, you know, X amount of years, we actually made more money than the men. And which dollar for dollar, that is true, which is actually a testament to how successful we oh have God. been. Say we made a hundred dollars in that year. We had to win nine games to make a hundred dollars. And the men made ninety dollars, but they had to win three games. So we still, yes, made more money, but we worked twice as hard. Here's where I see the argument of and and I know it's the argument that gets banned off the of social media. I know it's uh -huh. the argument that gets you flamed, but you know, I'll be the one who says it because I'm always what it goes there is that <laughs> There's the argument that the men's game is three times as hard as the women's game, right? So because you're playing against the best of the best in the world from a, a number of teams. You know, once again, four teams in the world have won the Women's World Cup. There are dozens and dozens and dozens of teams that are potential contenders for the men's cup. They're training since they were kids to win this medal. Uh, that same level of competition just doesn't exist, even if you take out the gender differences, right? Remove the gender differences, the competition isn't there. This is the jaw dropping moment, the jaw dropping moment. The claim was not that they had to work harder to get paid more. The claim was that they got paid less because they were being discriminated against. And then at the end, you see Rapinoe with a smirk on her face. Yeah, sure, we got paid a little more, but we had to work harder. We had to succeed more. That was not the argument. The argument is that they got paid objectively less because they're being discriminated against. And I mean, that's just, that, that should let you know, you've been lied to for an hour and a half and for five years. <laughs> We had to win nine games to make $100. And the men made $90, but they had to win three games. So we still, yes, made more money, but we worked twice as hard. If the fundamental notion is that in order for us to be paid equally going forward, we have to win more and we have to win at the highest levels. The kind of pressure that that puts on them is... Um, quite frankly, I don't think it's remotely lawful, <laughs> but we will see if the Ninth Circuit agrees with that. The, essentially, now they're hanging their hats on. We weren't the rate of our rate of pay was lower, right? Our rate of pay was lower. Don't don't look at the guaranteed money. Don't look at any of that. Don't look at total compensation. We just if you just just look at bonuses alone, just look at bonuses alone, right? Their bonuses are higher, so we're being discriminated against. That seems to be their argument at the end. One thing, Rapino, the client, just made an admission that contradicts the position that her lawyer subsequently took in the next minute. Rapino said, not that we worked harder for equal pay, that we worked harder, but got paid more. 30 seconds later, you have the lawyer come in and then frame it as they got, they have to work harder for equal pay. That's not even what the witness just said or the client. It's, <laughs> you got paid more. <laughs> yeah. it, 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 okay, it, it's just, it's... I, I think they're banking on the fact that nobody who watches this documentary is even going to get to the last 15 minutes because I would be uh, asleep or enraged by the 15 minute mark. So no, no one's even going to get there to know. But, no, but but they're just going to no, they're just riding the emotional high throughout all of it. Right. They're not listening to the words mm -hmm. that are coming out of their mouth, and they're certainly not splicing the thing that you noticed right there. Which, by the way, Viva, that's that's a very fine detail that takes a lawyer that's just not paying attention to the music, the emotional music, that's not paying attention to the graphics, that's just listening to the words coming out of their mouth and saying, those words don't add up, but people aren't even listening anymore. They're feeling, not listening. Ugh, so what, 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 at the end of the day, what do you guys rate LFG the movie? Do, what, what do, you, do you think the legal arguments were good to start? And now, because this is one of those few instances you get to see it from, hey, we're going to win. They have meritless claims at the end, like, oh, my God, we lost, and now we got to appeal. So uh, how, do you, how do you guys feel about the doc? I think it's, it, if you're going to rate you know, what, the legal arguments here, 
it depends on how you're rating it, right? If you're rating it on a on on how how um, on the skill of a lawyer that is spinning a case that they have bad facts, sure, they did a great job. With Fantastic. Yeah. Um, but if you're if you're you know rating their their skill as lawyers um, in terms of of giving a good legal argument um, and that is actually convincing when you you have access to the facts, you have access to the information. No way. I go with I go with great. It was it was five out of five missed penalty kicks. It's one of those great things where you love watching how badly they failed because all of those arguments, it's like this class is what you don't do as a lawyer. You do not <laughs> promise your client an outcome. You do not say there is no counter argument. You say, so USSF makes a number of counter arguments against our case. I don't think even one of them has the slightest bit of merit I'm not saying, this is meritless it's like one after another after another and they're missed they hit they kick somebody in the crowd in the face i mean like the ref gets hit i mean it's just all these sorts of situations where you say don't do this and this is a story that you should learn from as a young aspiring lawyer so i loved it it is paid propaganda through and through this looking at this documentary is what it looks like to live in your Twitter ideological silo where nobody challenges you. This documentary is, I call it a legal safe space for everybody who wants to believe what they want to believe and never get challenged by the other side. And then one day you get shattered out of your safe space and it's a judge that does it. And then you have to face the arguments and you have to face the positions of others where had you just been challenged by them in the first place, you probably would have been more prepared both for the trial and for the outcome. Now, if you've made it to this part of the video, first, I want to thank you for watching. And second, if you want to see these longer discussions, it's about two hours, it'll be at natethelawyers.locals.com where you'll be able to see the full discussion. It is a behind a paywall. I think it's just $5 if you want to go view not only that, but all the other um, premium posts that are on local. So check it out. Um, I want to thank Viva. I want to thank Legal Bites. I want to thank Legal Mindset. The links to all their channels are in the description, so you can please go check them out. They have some really, really amazing stuff, and I think you guys will like it. So my name is Nate the Lawyer, and I will see you in the next video. Peace.